This episode is brought to you by the Strong by Ash 12-week training and nutrition program. So much more than just a training and nutrition program underneath with a lot of accountability and education. If you're looking to make an impact with your gym comeback, as soon as gyms reopen, then this is the program for you. If you found that you were hitting a plateau in the gym, or you're ready to step your training up, or you're finally ready to make some real results with an educated coach, then this is the training program for you. Class one sold out really fast, and class two is now open and spots are selling out quick. 12-week training program, Strong by Ash, starts as soon as New South Wales gyms reopen. So make sure that you have an impact with your gym comeback. Check the website squatclub.com.au forward slash strong by ash or check out my Instagram profile for the direct link and more information as well as epic, epic transformation photos, which you could be next. Welcome back to a new episode of the Strong by Ash podcast. Welcome to everyone who has uh, who's joining for the first time. Thanks for joining. And if anyone has listened before and returning back, thank you very much for your support. And I hope you're enjoying it so far. Um, I hope you guys are having a really good week so far. Um, my week has been full on at the moment. Uh, it has been for the last few weeks with this lockdown. Currently, um, I'm looking at trying to implement things and um, try and look at ways to improve the brand of Squat Club while we're in isolation or while we're, while we're forced to close down for this time being, especially now as things are starting to open back up. It's, um, you know, it's making me work even faster and harder to try and make sure that everything is ready to go for when we open. So I'm really, really looking forward to uh, opening the doors again and getting everyone back in and you know, I, I look at it as if it's a, a massive playground for adults. So, you know, I've been trying to find things to, to make it even, you know, a more enjoyable experience for people as well as, you know, looking at ways to have to improve the service too. So I'm really excited for everyone to come back in and uh, there's some big things planned when we, uh, when we return. So um, today I wanted to talk to you about the recipe for results. So um, I've worked with a fair share of clients in my 10 years of uh, being a personal trainer. Um, so I, I would like to hope I know a thing or two, um, you know, to, to get results for people. Um, you know, I do specialize in fat loss. So it's something that I wanted to talk to you about today. Um, how people do get the results that you see. Um, and it's, I think I'd like, I, I want to set up a, a recipe for you guys so you know especially when you know getting back into the gym like you may have um, a structure to be able to put in place for you to be able to follow and be able to get the results so that's something that I thought would be really good for you guys to learn um, that side of things and let's um let's get into it so you from the very beginning you need to understand what and, and think about what is your goal um, and that's w- which this is tied into one of my other uh, podcasts on motivation is finding out what that goal is and that's what's going to help motivate you and inspire you to create really good habits to get to where you want to be. Um, you need to make sure that the goal sticks, in, sticks into you um, f- with your mindset and don't think of it on, like, on face value. Yeah, I just, want to, you know, I just want to look good. Like why? Why do you want to look good? So find the specific goal of what you're after. Um, and then be able to work towards that. So once you have figured out what the goal is, then we need to look at trying to build your your structure. And it starts off with um, a, a few factors, um, predominantly a lot of training and nutrition. So let's gonna we're gonna dive straight into the first part of the training. So with training, we need to build a structure, and we need to make sure that. With the goal that we have in mind, we need to make sure, okay, cool. So we have that goal in mind of, let's say, for instance, we want to, let's take an example, right? We want to lose body fat. That is our main goal. We've been in isolation for two months and we're now looking to try and improve our body composition because I'm not feeling as confident um, and I want to be confident because I felt very comfortable at home and I haven't moved much. I haven't really stayed on track with my nutrition. And I'm ready to break that now and get back on track, all right? So that could be the goal. 
Then you need to think about in terms of your training, what areas do you want to focus on? Is there certain body parts that are lagging? Is there something that you really just want to build up? Um, or is it, you know, overall body composition is what you want to try and um, improve? So, you know, you could be looking at, for instance, um, your glutes. Like we might be wanting to look at building the size of our glutes as well as looking at losing, like we're looking at improving our body composition. So once we have the idea of what the goal is and then the areas of the focus of what our training wants to be around, then we can start to build our training program. Um, the next step is we need to figure out how many days are we going to commit to with training? When, when I sit down with a brand new client, I will speak to them and find out exactly what they're after, what their goals are, and also what their expectations are. And then also like a time frame. Once I've figured that part out with them, we then look at a timeline or per week and say, okay, so how many days can you actually commit to training? And I want 100% truth that you're going to be able to reach those days with no excuses. So that's something that you should do as well. You should, you should stick, to, uh, stick to a certain amount of days and commit to it. Um, there's no point in building yourself or following a five or a six day or maybe even a four day training program if you can only commit to three days or so. Um, it's not going to help you with your progress. And look, yeah, it may help to, to some degree if you haven't trained in a while. But if we're not looking at, if we're not building, um, you know, we're not training around the focus of that program, we're not going to get the best results that we're after. So you'll see as we keep going into this, why it's going to be very important to follow the, your training days and be consistent at that. And you'll see why that um, if we are missing days, it can it can have a negative, not so much of a negative effect. It, it, it definitely won't set you up for the progress that you're after. So please make sure that you're honest with yourself and you're true, true to yourself with how many days are you actually going to commit. And then from there is that's when you can start to, to get into the sexy stuff of trying to build up your training program. Um, so when we're looking at building our training program and we know what the focus is or like, you know, it could be, you know, for, for guys, it could be like, I'm wanting to look at increasing my delts or my shoulders or my, uh, my arms, you know, or for, for the girls, it could be like, I'm looking to build on my hamstrings or my glutes. So you would look at trying to increase the training frequency of those body parts. Um, I would recommend training all body parts at least a minimum of twice a week. And then with the body parts that you're looking to build up, you know, you can train them, I'd say three to five days a week. Um, the, we want to look at trying to increase the training frequency. Um, with majority of your body parts, you know, we want to start off in the lower render scheme of things when it comes to sets per week. So we could look at, you know, like your lower end of 10 to 12 sets per body part per week. And then we can start to progress that and come up to 15 to 20 rep, uh, sets of working sets um, of body, per body part per week. And then you would split that up with multiple days. So um, that's something that you, it, it is going to be important. You don't want to train um, the body parts just once a week. The, the old myth has gone where you would train once a week on, you know, you do one day, day one is shoulders and chest. Day two is, you know, quads and hamstrings. Day three is arms, you know, like day four could be your back, you know, and you're only going to, and then you might have a rest for a few days. You don't want to do that. You're not going to progress as well. So we need to make sure that we are training with a greater frequency and we're, we're increasing the frequency of training per body parts, okay? So at least twice a week and then with the, the lagging body parts or the body parts that you're looking to improve on, then making sure that we do increase the, the training frequency of that, maybe three to four to even five days a week. Um, and then when it comes to, to that, then we need to look at um, building the foundation of your training program. So while we have the, the training frequency of what we're going to be after with body parts, we also need to look at like that compound moves. So our compound moves are like our multiple major muscle groups um, and they're going to be like your bread and butter. They're going to be your staples. And if you can think about, I guess like building a program is like building a house, right? So you would, the first thing you would do is you would lay that foundation down that concrete slab and then this is what the this is what they are too so your um your big lifts could be like a squat it could be a deadlift it could be a bench press it could be um, a hip thrust 
Um, you know, it could be an overhead press. There's many, many big compound movements. Um, and then they're going to be your foundation and your core of your training. And these things here is something that we want to try and focus on and keep in your training program and progress on that. So I will look at that and then starting to build the compounds in there. Um, then you can start to add on the exercises that are going to complement those, um, those bigger moves and also for, the, um, for your goals too for the body parts. Um, when it comes to training intensity, we need to make sure that we're, we're training at a higher, a higher intensity. So what we kind of go by on is a, is a scale. So I guess me as a coach, um, you know, I would look at, look at how the, the, the client's strength is and then I would prescribe them with a certain amount of weight for their compound or their foundation lifts and then that's set. The other movements is something that I would prescribe them with an RPE scale. Now, an RPE scale stands for rated perceived exertion. So it's a scale of one to 10 and it's up to the client to pick a weight depending on what RPE I've set them. So generally we sit in an RPE of seven to nine. So as a little quick understanding how it works, an RPE of 10, if we went for, let's say 12 reps, right? So it's three sets of 12 at an RPE of 10. An RPE of 10 means you have zero reps left in reserve because you're failing on that last rep. An RPE of nine means that you have one rep left in reserve. Once you reach 12, you feel like you could have got one rep left in you. An RPE of eight would mean that you have two reps away from failure. RPE of seven is three reps away from failure too. And then you can also like look at, you know, in-betweens and seven and a half, eight and a half, nine and a half. Um, so when it comes to training, we want to try and sit in that seven to nine RPE range. Um, that's where we're going to get the most amount of results. So if you find that you're training and, you know, this is a very common thing when it comes to, I guess, novice people training is that they will, they will lift the weights, but it's not as challenging for them. So something that, you know, we could prescribe as like an RPE eight or an RPE nine, we want to reach closer to failure, you know, and then you may find that that was pretty easy and you really, you could be doing like another 10, 15, sometimes even 20 extra reps. Like I've, I've tested this with clients and I've explained to them how the RPE works and I can get them at the end of their, their reps of 12, for instance, I, I will say to them, all right, keep going, keep going, keep going. And you'll see that they'll just, they'll keep pushing through. And I'll say, don't you stop, keep going. I want you to get past 20. And it was already the, the original set was for 12. They get the 20 and I say, keep going. I want you to keep pushing through. They might get to 25. And then, you know, you, you may see them get to 30. And then that's when they're really struggling. And then that's when they're starting to reach that RPE 8 or RPE 9. And then that's where the results will come from, from that. So we need to make sure that we are training to a correct RPE. Um, so I would definitely, when you get back into the gym and, and play around with that and see kind of where that you are at, with this RPE because we need to make sure that we are training with that RPE of seven to nine to get the maximum amount of results. So uh, anything lower, it's not going to be um, beneficial for the results that you're after. So I would recommend that and starting on down the lower end of the scheme of things. So we could look at you know RPE, RPE of seven to eight and then progress that as the, the training program goes on. Um, in saying that as well, we need to also look at adding progressive overload. That is the recipe of progressing with your training and all programs need progressive overload in them. Um, otherwise you will plateau. So uh, if you don't know what progressive overload is, it's, it's basically we're looking to progress the training volume uh, over time. So we, need, we, we want, there's many ways for progressive overload. We could look at uh, increasing the amount of sets that we do. We could look at increasing the amount of reps that we could do. Um, the, the load on the bar, um, we could look at uh, decreasing the seconds of our rest period. We could look at spending and doing more work in the same training, training time. There are many ways that we can look at in, increasing the pro or adding progressive overload. Um, we could look at increasing the range of motion. We can start to add in a little bit more of intensifiers. Um, we could look at increasing the RPE. So there are many, many ways to add progressive overload. But that's something that's very essential in, in a training program is having progressive overload implemented in there. So um, we don't always want to look at increasing the weight each week because like how, 
how how much can you actually keep increasing the weight? Um, you can't just keep increasing the weight each week. Otherwise, you guys will be lifting, you know, upwards of to 100 to 200 to 300 kilos, four, five. It's just impossible. So like we all have a ceiling. So it then becomes down into, okay, how can we look at adding or implementing progressive overload while minimizing fatigue for us to get better results? So, you know, it becomes a little bit of a, a game of chess to try and figure out the best way to do that. Um, and then with progressive overload, we're only looking to add in little, little changes. So adding like, you know, we're doing, taking a step at a time. It's just like, it's almost like a game of chess. Like you're just doing one, one move, letting that work itself. And then when we're then feeling stronger and we're feeling more confident and we're feeling okay with that, then we can look at making, making another move. So you don't want to make a big jump in training volume, but over time we would like to progress that. And it definitely doesn't have to be every week, but it is over time. So, you know, we could we could look at that and you could go, all right, so for the first three weeks, we're gonna go three sets of 10, three sets of 11, three sets of 12. Then we'll go back, and then we'll go into week four and then we may increase the weight. Then we'll go three sets of 10, three sets of 11, three sets of 12. So we're looking at progressing that way and the reps can still come down and we can then add in weight again and then just carry on with the progressive overload um that's a pretty basic one or you could look at increasing the weight um or you could do for two weeks or so two to three weeks you could add on you know two sets and then come in week three we add now three sets then we may even look at adding four or five sets over time like so we just want to make sure that we're adding little movements of our progression for us to keep progressing our training and then um, I guess when it comes to if we're training with a higher RPE and we're adding progressive overload into our training we need to make sure that we are scheduling deloads in our training so a deload is where we're decreasing all our training volume down to a more so like maintenance level and be able to give us time to be able to recover um, for our next training block this is something that I, I mean, before I kind of got into all this uh, with training uh, and coaching, I didn't know anything about progressive over. Oh, sorry, not I actually didn't know anything about progressive overload back in the day, but um, also with with deloads, and I would find that, and you may find too, if you're training at a higher intensity continuously, and you feel like you'll begin to get tired, lethargic, and then that's when injuries start to happen, and also your your progress will start to plateau. And this is because now our body is really fatigued, so it needs time to recover. So we need to take a step back for a week, reduce our training volume. And, and again, just like progressive, progressive overload, we can do it in many ways. You know, you could look at decreasing the weight. You could look at decreasing the reps. You could even decrease the sets. Um, and you can also decrease the RPE. So there are many ways to do that, but we need to make sure that we're reducing down our load or our volume. So then we have enough time to be able to recover and then we go into the following week and we can go back into training again and progressing. So um, generally we like to schedule a deload towards the end of the program um, and then we can go back into a brand new program coming to week one after we feel fresh um, from, our, um, from having a deload the week before. And then I guess the last part is with this is that we want to make sure that we're having, um, we're having a long time with our training program. So you definitely don't want to have different workouts every single week. And like if when if we're having different workouts, we're not allowing ourselves to to progress with that. And again, we can't use progressive overload because our training program is changing each week. So we need to make sure that we are keeping our training fairly consistent and we're focusing on progressive overload by getting stronger or lifting more over time. Um, what you will find is is that and I'm sure like you've all felt it if you're all listening right now, I'm sure that you're all trained, is that you'll find, you know, that muscle soreness. And the, with the muscle soreness comes down for muscle damage because your body hasn't adapted to that training program just yet. And you may get that soreness. But with that muscle soreness, it, it, it's, it prohibits us from able to progress. So as the program carries on, our muscle soreness each week will start to decrease. And as that decreases, our progressive overload can start to increase. But if we were to train, change our workouts each week, where we're allowing more opportunity for muscle soreness, which 
isn't a great thing for progressive overload. And then we aren't able to progress and get the best amount of results. So definitely do not have uh, different workouts each week and you want to have a solid structure. Um, with my clients, I usually build them a program that would last probably from four to, to six weeks, uh, allowing them to, to be able to build on the program that I've set them from the very beginning and we build up and then from there, we'll tape it down, have a deload week and then we'll have a new program and we do the same thing again. So that is something that um, I do stress is to have that implemented into your training program. Um, and then I guess with the last part is that especially getting back into training after this time where we've been closed, closed down or that we, we can't train as effectively as we would all like to in the gyms is that stick to the basics. Don't go in and think that you're training just like you were before the gyms closed down. We want to make sure that we, um, we start off again from the beginning and, and taking steps for us to progress. Um, don't go and do all these different intensifiers. Um, don't think that you'll be able to lift you know, the same weight as what you did when you when you left you left the gym for the last time prior to all this as well. So you know, take a step back and allow yourself time to be able to build up. And with that as well, we can look at trying to add that progressive overload over time. So just make sure that we um we we slowly build into it, and then as things progress, you could then later on look at adding intensifiers. Could be drop sets could be supersets, um, it could be rest pause methods. Um, you know, we could look at increasing the range of motion for things. Um, you could do one and a half reps, but these are little things for later on. You want to start off with the basics of things first, and then you can use those tools as part of progressive overload when the time comes, but there wouldn't be any need for that right at the beginning. So, you know, stick to the basic stuff. Now, when it comes to the nutrition, that's obviously the biggest part. So when it comes to looking at, at losing body fat, you can train the fucking house down. But if you don't have the nutrition inset in place, you're not going to get the results that you're after. So you need to make sure that you're, you're eating in a calorie deficit. And if you're not in the, eating in a calorie deficit, no matter how hard you train, it's not going to come off. And it's, it's not, you're not going to give the results that you're after. So what I suggest at the beginning is find out where your rough calories are. So understand um, where your daily activity rates are. And again, like there are, there are many uh, online calculators these days online. So you can pop, a, pop all your details in for free and, and then be able to get um, your calories from there. But you basically want to know your, your daily activity rate. Okay. And with that, you want to be very honest. I found that, um, you know, people may be dishonest with themselves with it when it comes to this part where they may be sitting down in an office each day, uh, all day, and they may ask, what's your activity level? And because you train maybe three days a week, you're like, yeah, I'm pretty moderate. I'm pretty moderate to active. I train, you know, I'm not, definitely not lazy. But how many, like, how much are you actually moving during the day? You're actually sitting down on your ass all day. And, you know, like if, you, if you're tracking your steps, it'd be a good idea to check how many steps are you reaching because um, there could be a good chance that you're, you're, being underactive of what you actually think that you are. Um, I find that very, very common with clients is that they will think that they are being more active than they actually are when starting out. So um, be honest with yourself. And I would look at just trying to track your steps as a guideline. Don't try and change anything just yet, just to see exactly how active that you are on a day-to-day -day basis. Once you understand that and then you have set your calories or your calorie deficit, we then need to work out the macronutrients of things. Now, the first and most, the biggest priority of the macronutrients is going to be your protein. We want to make sure that we're eating at least 2.2 grams per kilo of body weight if we're training, okay? This is going to have help us with performance. It's going to help us maintain the muscle. And in some cases, it's going to help us build our muscle. So we're looking at improving our body composition. You know, when it comes to people saying that they want to lose weight, do you actually want to lose weight or do you want to lose body fat? Because there's two different things. And we want to make sure most of the time we want to look at dropping body fat. So we want to try and maintain that muscle because when we start to lose the body fat, that's when all the shape starts to show. Whereas if we're looking at just losing weight overall, we're not focusing on our strength training. We're not focusing on our protein. 
yeah, we may lose weight because we're decreasing our calories, but we're not going to have that, you know, like that, I guess like that muscle tone that people are after. Um, you could still look, you could be skinny and chubby, you know, you may, that's, that's, that's a thing. Like people, you need to make sure that you are still maintaining the protein intake to be able to keep that muscle, which is going to help you with how you want to look. So making sure that that protein is going to be the highest priority. Then with that, you want to spread that protein intake throughout the, throughout the day. Um, now, when it comes to the protein, what we want to do is if you are a leaner individual, we want to go on the higher end of things when it comes to our protein intake. If you're, you know, you're mid, then you can stay in the middle part of the, of the, the scale. And then if you're more overweight, a bit more obese, then you can bring down your protein. So that's something for you guys to, uh, to take into consideration. Now, with the remainder of your calories, you can then begin to divide them as you wish into carbohydrates and to fat. Now, I would suggest two things is to think about how you eat in terms of your lifestyle and what your food choices that you usually use, uh, usually eat with. But then also you need to think about performance too. So carbohydrates is going to help you with performance fat not so much okay fat's going to be more for hormones and also for great tasting foods okay carbohydrates is going to be for your energy so we need to make sure that we we do have a higher carbohydrate intake and then um and then also have a, a what i would recommend is having a lower fat intake um and then what we want to do then is once we have set a carbohydrate and our fats, as well as our protein. We then look to prioritize and set up our meals for the week. Now, if you're planning your meals for the week ahead, it is so much more of a greater chance for you staying on track than, than someone who isn't planning their, their meals uh, ahead of time. So something that I do, I would definitely do, on a, I have done it religiously, is just plan all my meals on a Sunday. Now, I'm not saying that I have to go and plan all my dinners and my breakfast, but I would definitely set up and build my lunches. Being at work, um, I'm going to have that all set there for me. I've already calculated everything, so it's already set. For me, my, my, uh, my breakfast will always stay the same, um, and then also the snacks will stay the same. The, the dinner portion will change each day, but I already know because I went shopping on the weekend, I already know what dinners I'm going to have for the rest of the week. So making sure that you, um, you're planning all of this beforehand. Now, if you, you do know my fitness power, then um, you'll understand. If you don't, then I highly recommend you guys downloading the app, My Fitness Power, and start tracking your food. Um, but in terms of how I would set it, so then you have your calories, you have your protein, fat, and carbohydrates. From there, you would then start to Build your food in my fitness pal. Now, if you're like me, like I just said, then is that if you're if you're putting in, you know, the consistent foods that you're having majority of the day, if you put that in on the day one, and if you have your lunch, your snacks, your breakfast is all the same, then I, what I would suggest is doing selecting them all, copying them and pasting them to the next day, to Tuesday, then to paste it to Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and so on. And then if your dinner is different then you can then jump on to, let's say, Tuesday and then enter in your dinner. With your dinner, you could then look at modifying how much of what you're eating on that meal according to your macros that's already been set for you. And then as you adjust that, you can get really close with the macros that you set. Then you can also then go and do that for Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, etc. Okay, so that's something that I found is a pretty easy hack to be able to follow and track your macros. Now, if you, um, if you go and try and wing it each day, it's going to be a tough time. I can tell you that right now. Majority of my clients who have got really good results have planned ahead of time and they've had that and they've made it a priority. Look, it does not take long for you to sit down on my fitness power and set up your meals throughout the week. It does not take time. And if you don't have that time, then you need to make time and make it a priority because like I said at the beginning, if you don't have your nutrition in check, you're not going to get the results that you're after. So I do stress as that one, 
is please jump onto MyFitnessPal, plan your meals ahead of time to the calories and macros that's been set and be able to adjust things ahead of time so then you're nailing your macros and then you could stay within like two to five grams away from your carbs, your protein. Um, you know, you could stay around between five to 10 grams away from your, or two to five grams away from your fats as well. So um, by just by adjusting that ahead of time. Um, now with the food choices, look, I would suggest that you would have 80% of the, the whole nutritional foods, which I've discussed this on another podcast. Um, about nutrition is that we want to make sure that we are still prioritizing our health, um, but then we also want to make sure that we we still have foods that we enjoy because end of the day, if we're looking for the goal of losing body fat, this is not a quick game. This is definitely not a quick game at all, and we're going to be in it for a long haul. And if we're in it for a long haul, we've got to be able to be consistent at it, and it has to be sustainable. For it to be sustainable, we need to make sure we're doing things and eating things that we enjoy. So do not take out too much stuff that you enjoy and allow at least 20% of the foods that you eat during the day for foods that you enjoy. That's how we're going to be able to have a lot better of a balance and we're going to be able to have a lot more consistency with our nutrition and also our journey. When it comes to the foods as well, another thing to take into consideration is eating for your performance. So where we're eating food, which is going to be energy, we need to use energy for our training. And if we're underperforming with our training, our progressive overload, our training RPEs as well, you know, we could, if we're not eating for the performance for the training, we could go backwards with our training. So what I do recommend is eating carbohydrates before you train for you to be able to perform better and be able to help with building on your progressive overload or your strength training structure. I would look at minimizing the fats around or before your training because usually fats will kind of make you feel a little bit more sluggish and it will definitely want to be able to give you that pump um, or give you that energy for training. So kind of staying away from, from those type of things. And then you could look at like quick carbohydrates to give you that fast acting carbohydrate, fast fast acting energy. Um, you know, you could look at some lollies or some um, cereal um, or like even like some energy drinks, caffeine as well can help too. So, you know, look, making sure that we're eating for performance too. So you, I mean, you'll know as well, if you've, you've trained on an empty stomach, like you don't feel like training, like you feel flat and you, you, you actually don't want to perform as high as you normally would. Um, it's definitely harder to get a sweat and to get a pump on as well. So you make sure that we get the, the carbohydrates, get the glycogen in us and be able to help us with our performance. Now, now that you've got the nutrition set, we then need to look at adjusting when, this, when necessary. So when it comes to adjusting your macros, um, we need to look at our measuring. So you, know, you can take girth measurements, you can look at scale weight if you want to. I would definitely not recommend that being the only focus of your progress. Um, you can take, take photos as well. Um, and also looking at how your clothes are fitting. When things start to slow down, you need to have an overview of your last two to four weeks because I'll keep things fairly similar. I need to have an overview and, and think if it's slowing down, have I been 100% compliant to my nutrition? And if you said, yes, I have been 100% compliant over the last two to four weeks, and results have really slowed down. My measurements have stopped. And I then would look at dropping your calories by five to 10%. If you're honest with yourself and think, mm, nah, I haven't been as on, I haven't been as adherent to my nutrition as possible. I haven't been very compliant. Well, then I would say, look, keep your macros the same and really nail your nutrition over the next week. And once you start nailing those macros, then you may see a difference. So I would look at those two factors and look, you need to be honest with yourself because your body, I wish I've, I've mentioned this in a previous podcast, is that your body will start to adjust with how many calories you're, you're burning and it will start to slow down things to be in a comfortable state. So for us to be able to keep getting the results that we're after, we need to make, make sure that we're in a, in a calorie deficit. Now, we need to sit at the highest end as possible at the start and then by, with, with being in a calorie deficit and then dropping our calories over time. If we were to 
suddenly drop our calories right to the beginning and sit at the, you know, the magical 1200 calories. Yeah, you may lose weight, body fat, water, muscle at the beginning, but over time, things are going to slow down. It is just the nature of the body. And when it slows down, you need to either A, burn more energy, or B, consume less calories. And if you're eating 1200 calories, you've got to eat less or you need to burn more calories. You're in for a tough time because it's pretty hard to move around from there. You know, imagine sitting and then going into a thousand calories and then going into 900 to 800 and you're having to train five, six days a week, you know, or maybe you have to look at adding cardio. It's definitely not a, a good time and it's not someone that someone should be putting themselves into. You're going to set themselves up for, um, for injury and you're definitely not going to be able to sustain that as well and as a health aspect too it's definitely not and being putting yourself in a good position so we need to make sure that we're eating in the highest end of possible being in a calorie deficit and then dropping our calories down five to ten percent when it's required um, because by the end of the day like if you depending on how long that your your fat loss journey is you know you could be sitting it down towards the end at 13 1200 calories you know i've had i actually i've, I've had clients on there um i won't have them at the start but you know, things will start to slow down and you need to then drop more calories or you need to get them to, to move more. So making sure that you are staying at the top end at the, at the very beginning. Now, what I kind of just said then with that last part was moving more. We need to also make sure that we are building on our NEAT. Now, our NEAT stands for N-E-A-T, Non-Exercise Activity Thermogenesis. So this is now the calories that you burn that isn't to do with exercise. Now, this is to do with like your, your steps. Um, this is for you, you know, everything else that you're doing that's not exercise, this is what this is about. Now, you could be from, let's say, for instance, you wake up in the morning, you go to the bathroom, you go and brush your teeth, you walk down to the kitchen, you walk back up, you put your clothes on. There's, that's, that's neat, right? Um, you could be going and parking your car and you then from parking your car, you're going to go walk to the station, jump onto the train. And then once you arrive at the station, at the old station where you're about to get off, you walk to work. That's neat. You need to, once you get into the office, the building, you then have to, you decide to walk up the stairs instead of taking the, the lift. That's increasing your need. So, there are many ways. Um, what else is another one? So you could be, instead of staying at, sitting at home on the couch, you could be going for a walk. That's neat as well. So we need to make sure that we are increasing and having a higher neat for us to be able to put us in a greater calorie deficit. If we're eating what we think is a calorie deficit, but we're not actually moving as much, we're not going to get the best results. So while our nutrition looks like we're in a calorie deficit, but if our body isn't moving as much, then we can start to slow things down. So I would look at a great way to look at your NEAT is by having a step tracker. Like, like me, I've got like an iWatch, an Apple Watch on now, and I'll be able to track my steps. Um, I look at that for what I, what I usually do with clients is that I'll let, them, I'll let them do their own thing for the first two weeks. I'll look at their calories. I'll look at how they're eating. I'll also look at how they're moving throughout the, 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 the last two weeks. From there, I'll be able to set themselves, set them some certain goals. So I wouldn't be going, okay, so, you know, I looked at my steps over the last week <clears throat> and I'm hitting only 2,000 steps. I sit on my ass all day and I, don't, I really don't move. Well, then you don't want to prescribe yourself, you know, 12,000 steps. Like that's ridiculous and that's going to be really hard for you able to achieve those, like those step goals. So you would look at something that becomes a bit more achievable, but the idea of having a step goal is that it's going to make you a lot more conscious with moving and it's going to keep you a lot more accountable because you have a number that you have to keep reaching. So you're going to be moving more. And if you're moving more, you're going to be burning more calories. So you can see why this works with the nutrition. And if we're not moving as much, well, then we're not going to be burning as many calories. And if we're eating in this calorie deficit, well, look, the, 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 the gap between how much we're eating and how much we're moving is a lot smaller and we're not going to get the results that we're after. So by, by making sure that we're increasing our need, we're going to increase that calorie deficit. 
So um, there is, I have so many clients and I don't know if you, look, you may have seen some of my work. There's a great percentage of them. I'd say majority percentage of them who have got results. I don't prescribe them any cardio. Well, definitely in, in a shorter period of time, I, I haven't prescribed them any cardio. Um, I, like the, the, the girls from my strong by Ash program on my phase one, they didn't do any cardio. And I just prescribed them with their neat goals of how many steps that they need to reach and making sure that they're eating in their calorie deficit. And then that was it. So no cardio was prescribed. We do use cardio, but a cardio is going to be only a, a tool to assist us when fat loss starts to slow down. Now, like I said before, is with adjusting things, we could either look at one, dropping our calories, or two, increasing the energy burned. Now, we can look at increasing the steps each day, which, look, it could be, that could be a harder one because if we're already reaching, let's say, 12,000 steps a day and then we ask, okay, cool, we need to now start to reach 13 to 14,000 steps a day, it could be a big ask, you know, as a time constraint um, depending on the individual lifestyle as well. So that could be a tough one. Whereas we could look at going, okay, so instead of doing that, let's look at adding a little bit of cardio in there. Um, let's go and burn X amount of calories and that's what we're going to be doing twice a week. So you could start to do that. I definitely wouldn't recommend um, going balls deep and going straight for four or five days of cardio because like I just said then with your nutrition and like I said before with your training is that your body gets adjusted with everything just like the cardio aspect too. It wants to stay comfortable. So it's going to understand that you're going to be doing four days of, of uh, cardio. It's going to understand the calories that you're trying to burn. It's going to try and preserve things so it stays in a comfortable state. So once we reach that point of, well, our body's starting to get used to it, we need to either, again, look at one, dropping our calories again, or two, increasing our energy output. You know, it becomes a lot more difficult. So we need to take stepping stones with our progression. We can definitely get results from taking one step. And then when things slow down, we let take another step, then another step, then another step. Or you could shoot yourself in the foot and take one giant leap, get results, but then things start to slow down and then you need to take another step again. So think about that when you're setting yourself up. But um, that's really all I'm going to talk about now. I feel like I could talk underwater with all this stuff. I love this type of shit. So uh, I, look, I hope you guys took a lot out of this. Um, I know there was a couple of belters in there. Um, and you wrote those things down. So um, thank you so much for listening. If you haven't yet, make sure to subscribe. And um, I'm putting these videos out on YouTube as well. So if you want to uh, watch me talk, I'm pointing to you, camera one, uh, then make sure you subscribe to me on YouTube as well. And uh, yeah, thanks very much for listening, and I'll speak to you guys later. Bye.